All right, amen. So we're finishing up this series. A little bit of a series kind of uh, goes along with the ministry training uh, theme, you know, that we get on Thursday nights. But ministering to the elderly, and we've talked to, uh, a little bit about this. This is the third part. I didn't originally think it was going to take that that long, but then as I started planning it out, I said this is going to have to be three parts. So we talked about, let me think here, uh, evangelizing. When you're knocking on someone's door and an older folk uh, comes to the door, just some things to think about and why it's important to be ready for them and to be able to uh, understand how they're going to be. But then you, last week uh, we talked about uh, ministering to shut-ins, going to nursing homes, going to uh, uh, various uh, places like that, hospital visits. We talked about no. So today my intention was to talk about how to deal with the elderly, like in a church service, like the faithful ones that come all the time and how to deal with them. And that, and that kind of goes uh, uh, in hand with that. But here's the idea uh, for tonight. And the reason we didn't do a Bible reading at first is because there's a lot of scripture we're going to get through. We'll read a lot of it together. I'll try to just quote some of it to you. But uh, the first blanks that you have there, if you're going to write notes, is serving together with, and this is an old f phrase I used to hear, or a title I used to hear a lot of Sunday school classes for the older folks, senior saints, senior saints, serving together with the senior saints. And when you think about that, and this has come up a few times in this series and, and other series that uh, just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how God works things out and, and a lot of things go hand in hand with each other. Sometimes I don't know why I'm preaching something that I feel kind of Lord laid on my heart. And then like later that week, I don't know if it, if it does anything for anybody else, but later on that week, something will happen. I'll be like, man, that's exactly what God was putting on my heart for that message. And, and it just kind of goes together. And, and here's the thought that I keep coming to when it comes to ministering to the elderly or basically just everybody in the church is that we're like a big family. All right. And uh, you certainly don't want to kick grandma out of the family right? just because there might be some some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hindrances, you know, or some obstacles that you have to endure with. And so we're talking about that. There is a weird kind of uh, mentality that's crept into the church that's like, hey, the, the older folks need to go. Let the younger people come come on the scene. And and I think that's wicked. Right. And I think that the elderly uh, not only have a right to be there. Many of them, you know, started a lot of the works that are there. They, they were there from the very beginning. But also their age and experience should uh, give us a sense of honor, right? Honoring them as, uh, as the Bible tells us to. We're going to talk about that a lot uh, tonight. But not only that, it's kind of a demonstration of what's happened with segregating the church to you got young people over here. And you got, you know, these different Sunday school classes over there. And really, the old, uh, uh, it was funny because, you know, I grew up, there were a lot of churches that I was in that they didn't necessarily talk bad about Jack Hiles, but it was like, that's a different camp than what we're in, <laughs> right? But the funny thing is, all of them had the exact same uh, Sunday school, like, set up and bus ministry. Everything was, like, right out of the Jack Hiles handbook, <laughs> which is kind of funny, right, because they were kind of, like, talking bad about him. And I've told people, right, that's kind of what's going on with the uh, so-called new IFB movement right now is a lot of people are like, oh, that's a bunch of heretics, and we don't want anything to do with it. Well, you wait 10, 15 years down the road, and everybody's going to be having the same uh, model, you know, of, of, of the way things run, I think. And one of the things on that is the family integrated service, yeah. right? And it's not just the new IFB that thinks that way. There's a lot of people that aren't even Baptists who have realized, you know, there's a lot of bad things that have come out of all the different segregation, you know, right. segregating. And so when you put the whole church together, it creates a sense of family. Hey, we're all in this together. And, uh, and I was talking to my wife on the way up here, and I was saying, yeah, I think maybe there would be some, uh, uh, some, cases where it's better to split them because of teaching and the young people. Of course, we still have a few kids hanging on uh, that we have a patch club there at, at, at Iola. But I really feel like the Lord just kind of have has been slowly just working that children's ministry out of there. In a way, it's sad to me because I've always dealt with kids and I love the, the little kids coming and all that. But on the other hand, I feel like the Lord's giving us a sense of family. Like those last two kids that are in there, they can learn. 
you know, to worship with the, the older folks. They can learn, just like kids that are raised in church learn, right? But it's going to take some work and take some effort. But it creates a sense of just family and this unit working together for the cause of Christ when we all meet together. And we see a lot of examples of that in the Bible where they all came to met together to meet with Jesus or they all came together, uh, you know, uh, in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, whenever uh, they, they, he called the assembly, they're all meeting there together. Of course, there's a lot of good uh, uh, things that we could talk about on that. So A is this, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We're a team, uh, if you will. And the greatest among us, according to the Bible, the greatest among us are not necessarily of more value to God. In fact, oftentimes, and many times, they're not as valuable as somebody who would be considered the least among us, right? The Bible says uh, in Matthew 23, let's go ahead and go there, that we shouldn't seek to be exalted over others. We should never seek to be exalted over somebody else no matter what. Matthew 23 Let's start with verse 8 there. But be not ye called rabbi. Now there's a lot of times, uh, you know, titles seem to be important to some people. Want to be called doctor, want to be called these different things, right? And it doesn't necessarily make that person wicked, but sometimes these titles be, be, are, uh, uh, they appear to be somebody who's just wanting to be exalted over everybody else, right? So we got to be real careful when it comes to titles. And he's saying, Be not called ye rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, Catholics, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. And then he says this, which is kind of shocking, and I'm sure it shocked them in that day, just like it would shock many today. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So that's a biblical principle. And, uh, you know, I just put this, uh, I actually wasn't even thinking about this uh, in, in relationship to this message, but I just put on Facebook, this thought was going through my mind. And I'll just, tell, I'll just be honest with you, somebody recently referred to me as humble, right? And so I'm thinking, hey, I'm a humble guy. And I said, wait a minute, that's pride. I just thought, I'm prideful for being humble. And then I'm like, hey, that was humble that I just realized that that was pride. And then I said, hey, that's prideful that I thought that was humble that, I, you know what I mean? <laughs> This human nature, man, we can't, be hum we can't even be humble. <laughs> I always tell people that when it comes to works. Like, uh, you know, if we could say, the Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If we, could, if we could say, hey, look at the good work that I did, well, we're, we're doing is we're bragging. And so God's, God's not happy with us bragging, right? That's pride. And so uh, he's saying, look, if you can ex ex uh, abase yourself, God's going to exalt you in due time, right? Uh, you know, he, he sees everything. He knows what's going on. He knows your heart. He knows your intentions. And he'll be the one that promotes or exalts somebody in due times. But we, we should be looking to exalt him primarily and then to uh, uh, esteem others above ourselves, as we'll talk about in a minute. Let me read James 2 for you so you don't have to turn there. But it says we should not be a respecter of persons. James 2 says... My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, uh, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you, your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts hearken my beloved brother and hath not god chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him and so he's saying look don't it, it, it's hard because we in our natural ability want to judge people right and it's hard to say hey this person that was would be considered a lowly person not popular doesn't fit in with us and let me say this poor people can do the same thing about rich people 
oh, we don't want to go to that rich neighborhood. Those rich people are all wicked, evil. Well, there's a lot of rich people in the Bible that were pretty decent, decent people, right? So we don't want to just have this mentality that's like, you know, if somebody's well off and, and, and they're successful, then they must be these, these terrible people or something like that. That's not necessarily the case. So a respecter of persons just means like it doesn't matter if they got a lot, they got a little, they're a different color, they're, you know, have some different, slightly different beliefs or something like that. Look, we're all... We're all in this together. If they're there for the right reasons, uh, we're all in together. Okay, we should esteem, see there, we should esteem others better than ourselves. Look at Philippians 2. I've been reading Philippians a lot lately. It keeps coming up, and, and a few people have even asked me, you know, to, for a certain verse, and I'm like, man, Philippians, go to Philippians. It just seems to be the one that's coming up. I'm pretty sure it's in my Bible. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. If there, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let me see here. Let's keep reading. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Man, that's hard. <laughs> we naturally want to take care of ourselves, you know. We naturally, uh, you know, I heard an old story one time. Uh, of course, we hear of the Titanic, and when the Titanic went sinking, you know, it was women and children first, and any guys that tried to get on, man, they were like likely to get, you know, beat up or something like that, because it was like, hey, you let the ladies and the children get on the boats first, uh, the little uh, rafts or whatever. Well, there's another story about a ship that went down in the 90s, Estonia, something like that. Anybody heard this story? And it's total opposite. Like, primarily, the only ones that survived that were men. Because they were like, hey, I'm getting off of here. I'm, I don't care about you guys. I'm saving myself. And it's just like two totally, some of it speaks to the time, you know, uh, the society that we're, the, you know, the big change in society. You know, it used to be all the men were gentlemen and they're concerned about ladies and children first and now they're not. Some of it just the human nature of man. Because look, even during Titanic, there were a lot of guys that tried to dress up like girls or whatever and squeeze on that ship because they were so selfish, right? But the Bible says that we should uh, think about others. Imagine ships going down and you put the life vest on somebody else who others would esteem lower than you, right? Uh, it's kind of like the, whole, the captain go down with the ship kind of thing. Right? Imagine having that. That's hard to do. We're not raised. We're not naturally, uh, we're not naturally uh, prone to that kind of thinking inside our mind. It's just like, man, I got to save myself, right? So, uh, uh, but the Bible says we should think of others. Here's a, a thought on this. All right, and I'm going somewhere with all this, but uh, w the thought is we can't leave our brothers and sisters behind. Now, I preached a message once to young people because uh, when I was teaching the teen class uh, years ago, um, I was thinking about this no child left behind. You guys hear <laughs> that? Uh, one of the, George, I think it was the first, George, uh, not George, George Washington, wow, <laughs> George Bush. Right, that, that came up with this program, No Child Left Behind, and it's ridiculous. Like, you know, if they're not ready to pass, don't pass them, right? And my message was, like, some people need to be left behind. And, uh, and I do believe that, okay? Now, here is the uh, thinking on that. Some people, you know, you're all going together, and some people are like, I don't want to go that way, okay? You're going to be left behind, but that's your choice, right? Other people, they want to go with you. Right, but they're going to need to be pushed, and that's your next blank there. They need to be pushed, or some need to be carried, right? But they need to get there. And I remember one of the first runs that I, maybe the first, I can't remember, races that I signed up for was a trail run, and I think it was like seven or eight miles, right? Two laps around this trail. And it was a pretty intense trail, lots of hills and, and stuff like that. At least in my mind it was. I mean, not like running in mountains or something, but a uh, pretty intense trail. And there was this uh, army group that, that came there, you know, maybe about six people. And they were all from the same platoon or whatever, and they had entered that race. And some of the guys 
were a lot more, a lot f more fit than the others. Some of them were bigger and out of shape, and some of them were young, and you could tell they just really wanted to sprint, and they probably could have been at the top of the line. But their instructions were, you guys all have to cross the finish line at the same time. And what that made people do is go back to some of those people in the back of the line and say, come on, man, you need to get going. You need to get, start running, you know. <laughs> and they had to encourage them to go. And I remember being really moved by that because here I am doing everything I can to get ahead. And I'm thinking, man, that takes a little bit of self-discipline uh, to say, I could run and pass all these guys, you know. You see some lady coming up. With, I mean, it's hard if you're a guy. I'm a slow runner, man. And when I see like an 80-year-old lady passing me up, that's hard for <laughs> And it happens, <laughs> okay? I'm slow, all right? I'm a slow runner. But, uh, but these guys, right, they could have been faster. They could have been at the front of the line, but they had to stay back with the guy that's the slowest. It's like the idea that the, uh, you know, uh, the, the person in the back, uh, you know, he has to get by at the same time you do. So it's kind of like the, the weakest link kind of idea, right? If, the, if there's that one link in the chain that's weak, the whole thing is weak. Right? So you got to do everything you can to strengthen one another, build each other up. Amen. Uh, Hebrews 10, I uh, skipped a couple of uh, uh, verses there, but let's go to, uh, I'll just read this to you. Hebrews 10, we're familiar with that. You turn to Galatians 6, 6 I mean 6, uh, verse 1. But Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. All right, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So we see there that we're supposed to provoke to good works. We're supposed to encourage, exhort, and try to help our uh, weaker brothers uh, keep up and, and come along. That's one of the reasons it's so important for us to go to church. I mean, right. a guy can stay home and, and get a lot of wisdom and know what he's talking about and be spiritual. Uh, but, you know, you, and I, I've actually never seen anybody really grow that's like that. I mean, they, they, we need each other. You see what I'm saying? But even someone that thinks that they got it, they don't need anybody else. Well, maybe they need you, right? right. And so that's why it's important to go and encourage one another. Uh, Galatians chapter 6. Sure. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Almost sounds contradictory when you first read that. Wait, he just said bear one another's burdens, and now he says every man shall bear his own burden. I think the idea is this. You need to help other people along, but what your primary focus is, I need to make sure I'm okay, right? I need to deal with my own life because I'm going to be accountable for the things that I do. And so I got to carry my own burden. But guess what? If you can do that, it's kind of like getting the beam out of your eye so you can see clearly to, to, to remove the mode out of your brother's eye. If I can take care of my own life and if I got things running in order and doing okay, now I can help my brother to do better, right? Amen. And so it's kind of like the whole... Uh, kind of cliche of, you know, you need to put your mask on, your air, air, oxygen mask on before you can help others get their oxygen mask on. I think they tell you to do that in the airplane. I never listen, okay? But anyway, <laughs> I mean, really, when, a cra when, a, when the plane's going down, are you going to take the time? Oh, what was it? Let's see, my seat now, that's a, that's a life buoy. <laughs> anyway, life buoy, what's it called? Flotation device. <clears throat> okay. Number three, did I miss any blanks yet? Okay, number three, we don't all have to do the same thing to be part of the team, but we all need to work together. All right, we won't even go to 1 Corinthians. You're familiar with that, I'm sure. Not everybody's the eye, not everybody's the ear. You know, if the ear said, oh, I'm not worth it because I'm not the eye, that doesn't make any sense. The body needs the ear and it needs the eye. Okay, now why do I say that in regards to ministering to the elder, elderly? Well, we might tend to think, well, they're not as valuable because they can't go out there and knock doors, you know, or they're not as valuable because they, you know, can't get up in front of people and, and do this or that. But the fact of the matter is they are valuable in God's yeah. eyes, and there's some great things they can do for us, 
uh, if nothing else, a lot of older people are the best pr prayer warriors. Amen. And uh, sometimes, man, I'll feel just like, man, I must be really being prayed for right now. And because uh, because Lord, Lord is just intervening in, in certain ways. And, you know, I try to pray myself. I mean, but but you just feel like, man, I just need that extra extra prayer. And a lot of times the older folks, I mean, I'll talk to them and Brother Webb, you know, even 92 years old and in the nursing home, can't get around. And, uh, you know, uh, I just talked to him. Last time I visited him, I said, man, you still praying for everybody? And, uh, and he said, I try to. But he used to. And he's, his mind's slipping a little bit. But he used to just start telling me, I pray for so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, and he's listing all these people that haven't come in a long time, right? But he's just kind of got this running list in his mind. And, uh, and he's trying to remember all these people he needs to pray for. And somebody might look at him and say, man, he doesn't get out and do this. You know, he's not involved in this ministry or whatever. But... He's doing what he can. He's trying to remember to pray for people. He's wanting, uh, wanting to help however he can. Uh, he's supporting the church, right? The Lord blessed him over the years uh, to be able to have a, a certain retirement. You'd never know it by looking at him, but he's, he was always able to help people and to give, a big giver in the church. And so uh, the Lord's using him in different ways that he might not be able to use somebody else. Doesn't make one person more important than the other person, right? right? So not everybody has to do the same thing but we all need to be on the same team working together. So uh, when a person's age makes them seem like a hindrance, is your next blank, you think, man, that, that person, and, and you know, I hate to even say that because I'd, I'd like to believe, man, I never thought that before, but there are times, there are times you see somebody and think, oh, man, what's she going to say right now, right? Uh, uh, we have a, a lady uh, if you think you know who it is, just don't, just don't even try to think that, okay? Because it might not be. <laughs> but there's a lady in the church who uh, has always been a grumbler and a complainer, okay? And uh, I remember one time I thought I was getting... Now, sometimes she'll say, hey, appreciate the sermon, God bless, or whatever. And other times she'll come to me, I, I just don't know what's going to come out of her mouth. One time I thought she was fixing to say, God bless you, or, some, or thank you for the sermon, or something like that. And she was like, you know what you ought to do? You ought to take that jacket off, and you ought to do this, and you ought to do that. And you to, I don't remember what all she said. And she was like, so you don't know how cold we are out there when you leave the thermostat up. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Another day, same lady, right? Uh, Valerie uh, likes to give out gifts on people's birthdays, ministry that she's decided to take on, and just to the ladies, okay? Uh, if, if guys say, hey, I didn't get anything for my birthday, I don't have that same <laughs> conviction. <laughs> so, so for the ladies, she tries to get them something, and she tries to stay on top of that. Well, it was the same lady's birthday, and so Valerie got her a bag with stuff inside it, handed it to her, and, uh, and her response was like, no, I can't have it. I don't want anything. <laughs> I mean, I can't explain everything, uh, all her reasoning or whatever, but she just totally rejected it. And my wife could have been offended, but she kind of liked the stuff that was in it, so she just kept it for us. <laughs> but sometimes that happens, and when a person walks up, you're like, oh, man, what are they going to say, right? And, uh, and so what we can do, though, is we can begin to get to the point where we think, this is a hindrance, right? Oh, man, this, the, I don't know what they're going to say. Or maybe it's a hindrance. I don't know, you know, uh, the pace isn't quite like I want to. Or, or uh, you know, as a pastor, there are obstacles. You know, we've talked before about the, uh, uh, the hearing aids or the hearing device that starts screeching in the middle of the ser service, uh, uh, you know, or, or different people's phones go off and they can't hear it. And it just keeps going off and going off. And you're like, somebody needs to answer that or, or shut it off or something, right? And uh, then they take it out and they can't find the right buttons. And they're like, what is I? Who's calling me here? And you got to like, like pause the service, right? And somebody might see, say, you know, man, this is just a hindrance, right? Give me the young people and get rid of the old people. I don't have that feeling. I, and, I'm, and I, Lord willing, I'll never have that feeling, okay? Because they have, uh, uh, so let me finish that statement. So, so when a person's age makes them seem like a hindrance, recognize this. If we're supposed to be working along with those who are poorer than us, the Bible says a lot about that, doesn't it? Less popular, uh, maybe the disabled, the needy. Jesus sure spent a lot of time helping those type of people, right? If we're supposed to do that, how much more should we be working with the elderly who have laid much of the groundwork for the very ministry 
Now, obviously, foundation is Christ. We understand that. But uh, a lot of these people labored really hard to give us what we have now, right? And we ought to be thankful for that uh, and, and, and to, uh, and, and to uh, show somehow show our thanks for that and to, at the very least, bear with some of the hindrances, what we think are hindrances, right? B, we can and should learn from our elders. We can and should learn. Leviticus 19.32 says this. I read this uh, in a previous lesson. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. My hair is starting to turn gray, so it sounds a little self-serving, but <laughs> I'm not old yet, okay? Uh, but but when, a, when you know when somebody's old, right? And you know they just have this about them. And uh, some are more honorable than others. I'll get to that in a minute. But you see them and you think, man, this person, we need to rise up. You know, we need to open the door for them. We need to hold something for them. We need to go, can I get your car for you? Can I, you know, uh, uh, whatever it is to help them and to honor them. I think that's a very godly principle. Look at Genesis 47. This is a passage that's always intrigued me. I've actually done three funeral services, uh, uh, two of them before I was even a pastor. That's a long story. But I have never done a funeral service on uh, somebody who was... Uh, that's not true. A couple of them were older, but uh, what I'm talking about are people that are members of the church who've lived faithfully and they've had long lives in their 90s and what have you. I haven't done a funeral on any of uh, any of those folks yet, but when I do, this is the verse that always comes to mind what, what it is I'm going to be thinking about, and that is whenever uh, Pharaoh sees... Uh, where did I say? I'm sorry, Genesis 47. When uh, Pharaoh sees uh, Joseph's family. You know, they all come into the land and uh, they're spared and all that kind of stuff. And then Pharaoh, see, he meets for the first time Jacob, okay, the patriarch of the family. And look at verse 7. And Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. I mean, here's a leader of that country Pharaoh's actually allowing them to come in and, and take care of them. But Jacob's the one blessing Pharaoh. I think, I think that's kind of interesting. But here's the thing that I wanted to point out. And he said him before Pharaoh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, where was I? <laughs> Verse 8, okay. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? That's a weird thing to ask somebody. <laughs> right? It's just he was intrigued by Jacob's age. And if you think about that, it makes sense. Pharaohs, from what we understand, uh, just looking at uh, history and archaeology and stuff like that, they were very caught up on living long. And they wanted to, that's why the embalming, and that's why, you know, uh, this idea of, I think their understanding of eternal life was like what, what's there is what's going to have to be, <laughs> what's going to have to live in eternity or something like that. And so they had this hang up apparently on long life and they prided themselves on being able to live for a long time. But this guy looked at, J at Jacob and said, man, this is an old guy. And he says, how old are thou? And, and I, I, that's what I think is going on. And one of the reasons I think that too is what Jacob says. Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. He's not bragging because, look, few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. So what he's saying is, yeah, I'm 130, and I don't know how old Pharaoh was at the time, but he's like, you might think that I'm old, but I ain't even got close to what the age of my fathers were. <laughs> so this, there was this honor in just having long life. And, uh, and I told uh, Brother... Brother Webb, on many occasions, I said, man, I don't know what you did, but you must have really honored your mother and father. Right. <laughs> because it says, honor thy mother and father that thy days may be long upon the earth. Right? So, so long life was actually something that was promised as a blessing for those. Now, I, I understand there's different circumstances why somebody might die young or whatever, but ultimately it's to be thought of as a blessing. So, uh, your first blank there in A, Pharaoh marveled at Jacob's age. And B, long life is a blessing in the Bible. Yeah. 
Now here's another thought. Age should be a sign of wisdom. It should be a sign of wisdom. Proverbs 16, 31, uh, Brother Dan just quoted this earlier. I don't remember why we, what we were talking about exactly. He said, the hoary head, that would be like, think about hoary frost, right? The white, uh, that kind of look like frost has. The hoary head is a crown of glory, Amen. right? So does that mean that everybody with gray hair is honorable? <laughs> Bernie Sanders? I mean, I, can think of, <laughs> I don't know why that came out, but I can think of a few people, right, that I've known in my life who are older, who were not good people, and they did not deserve to be honored, right? Okay, but here's the rest of that verse. It says, the hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So it's a little bit more than just saying, hey, that person's old, that person has gray hair, that person. Now, look, there's a time, I mean, because we don't need to just sit there. The first time we meet an older, older person, we don't need to sit and say, you know, well, I wonder if they've been good or, or not good. Hey, just treat them with respect. And right. if you have to stand uh, in honor of them or seek to help them, that's what we need to do. Okay. But if you know that they've served the Lord, they've been faithful, you say, well, I don't agree with them on every little doctrine. I don't agree with every methodology that they've ever done. Well, guess what? Your grandkids probably aren't going to like and agree everything that you've ever done in your life. Right? But... The, but we need to honor them and respect them because they've tried their best to serve the Lord and, uh, and be faithful. Now, obviously, if they're preaching, you know, false doctrine, that they don't just get an automatic pass because of their age. But it might affect the way that we treat them, even whenever it comes to rebuking them or something like that. Because, uh, uh, you know, we don't know everything yet. <laughs> We're, you know, we still have years to, to live. We can show them from the Bible. We can ask their opinion on things. I'll get to that here in a second. But, uh, but we are told to honor the elderly. It should, should be a sign of wisdom, but it, always, it, it isn't always, okay? But we are told to honor them. Number two there, today's leaders, or any generation, but specifically thinking about today's leaders, and especially I'm thinking about church leaders, they should seek the counsel from the elderly. They should seek the counsel from the elderly. Now, it's hard when, uh, again... There's a, there's a new, and I think this is a good thing, but there's a new generation of Baptists, fundamental Baptists that are saying, hey, man, there was a lot of things that went wrong in the old IFB. Right. And they're recognizing that, and they're rising up and, kind of, and, and being distinct from that group. That's where you get the, whole, the titles old IFB, new IFB, right? And so sometimes our, our thinking starts turning into old versus new, and you think, well, we're younger and we're better. And the older folks, we don't need to listen to them. In fact, we're going to disrespect them and we're going to do all that. Man, that, you don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Amen. Okay. Right. And so what we need to do is recognize, yes, we need to stand up. Maybe a younger generation and say, hey, there's some ways that our fathers went, grandfathers went, that wasn't necessarily right. And we need to stand uh, and do, go a different direction, slightly different direction. But that doesn't necessarily give us the right to just you know, disrespect uh, all the work that they've done, okay? And so we got to be real careful about that. So, uh, but we do need to also seek their counsel. That's where I was going uh, with that, is that sometimes we think that, oh, I don't want to know, I don't want to ask their advice. I don't want to think about how they used to do things or whatever, you know, it, you know. I got the Bible, I got the Holy Spirit. Well, that's true, but look, they have some wisdom they might be able to offer, and they might be able to help you, okay? Uh, First Kings... 12, uh, let's just, yeah, let's go read it. 1 Kings 12, we're doing good on time, so. First Kings chapter 12. And look at verse 6. I won't tell the whole story or read the whole story, but just a few verses here to give you the idea. And the king Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto his people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servant forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him 
and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have uh, spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people uh, that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it, uh, make thou it light. Oh, I'm sorry. The people that said, uh, Thy father made his yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And so what he's saying is the advice that the young crowd has given us, Hey, you know, we don't need to be lighter and softer. I'm not really trying to make a, a, a comparison here to the new IFB and the old IFB, but you could you could make it if it's if it needs to be made. They're saying, hey, maybe you need to be softer right here. And this guy says, no, man, my little finger is thicker than he's saying. He, the younger crowd saying, no, we need to be harder, right? And so uh, and so obviously he said, okay, that's the advice that I'm going to go with, and he forsook the advice of the older folks, right? So. Sometimes we do need to forsake. I already tried to make that clear. Sometimes we do need to forsake the advice that's given to us by the older folks. Just because they have the gray hair, just because they have the experience, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that they're right. Here's where we get our answers. This book's a lot older than they are. <laughs> okay? We get our answers from the Bible. However, it's not wrong to listen to what they're saying and consider that. Pray about that. Seek the, uh, seek the Lord's will on that and get the counsel from there. In this case, they did seek the older and then he sought the younger, and I feel like partly why he went with the younger is just because they're younger. Who wants to listen to the old folks, right? In that certain situation, he wanted to go, they go with the popular crowd. And so we've got to be really careful with that. And you, uh, you are aware of uh, Job. Uh, Job's friends sat around and uh, gave advice, and the last one was a young guy, and he said... Uh, 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 what's his name? Elihu? Yeah. Elihu. And he says, uh, he says, I've sat here and I've listened to you all because you're older than me, right? But I can't take it anymore. And he just started to begin to correct them and all that kind of stuff, which God says, I think, I believe he, God says all of them are wrong, right? Whenever you see God speak. But the idea was that even then, all throughout time, they've realized that we need to give the older men time to speak first and to let them tell us, you know, uh, uh, give us some good counsel and all. All right, so let me, let me just move on through this last part. There's not as much scripture in the very end of this. Uh, but today's leaders should seek counsel from the elderly. But here's the thing. We need to recognize their hindrances. And I don't mean like point out where they're a hindrance to us, but we need to recognize that the elderly have hindrances. Remember, we're working together, okay? So we have to understand uh, bear one another's burdens, right? We have to understand these are some of their hindrances. Number one, obviously they have physical hindrances, all right? We talked about that in previous lessons, but Ecclesiastes 12, I think, is a good uh, passage when it talks to, uh, to the fact, I mean, yeah, to the fact that older folks have some physical hindrances, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He's uh, finishing up this book here and he gets to chapter 12. He says, Remember now the Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So he's talking about, you know, while you're young, you don't understand what this is like, but the days coming where you're going to say, you're going to wake up in the morning and say, Oh man, another day. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't have pleasure in this, man. It's going to be painful. It's hard to get up out of bed, right? And then it says, uh, I'm not saying I'm there yet. I'm, I'm not old, but, uh, but it's, the day's coming, all right? And, uh, and the days uh, come not, uh, let me see here, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall uh, bow themselves, you think about the, 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 the joints, you know, start trembling. And that's something you see in almost uh, when they get a certain age. I don't know what it is exactly, but their hands start shaking. Their knees start shaking. It's kind of hard for them to even get their feet to stand still and to take their first step or whatever. And you see that, okay? And it says, the grinders, I think that's talking about the teeth. The grinders shall cease because they are few. 
And those that look out of the windows be darkened. Look, they have bad vision. They can't see what's going on. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. And he shall rise up at the voice of a bird. Uh, and all the daughters of the music shall be brought low. And uh, anyway, you get this picture as you read that text about what those evil days are, right? When we get to the point where it's not necessarily looking forward to how we're going to feel uh, that day. And, uh, and so certainly that's a hindrance that the, our older folks have. That's something we have to keep in mind and try to help them with. Getting from bed to the church pew is a big ordeal. I mean, my wife uh, doesn't necessarily appreciate this, but... Guys, you know what it's like, man. You can get up, rub a little bit of water in your hair, throw something on from your closet that doesn't look too wrinkly, and get over to church, and you're there in like five, ten minutes, right, if you have to. All right, I'm trying to see if anyone's shaking their head or if it's just me. <laughs> I can do that. My wife would prefer me to spend a little bit more time getting ready, but, but uh, I can do that. The day is coming where I can't do that. It's going to take me a good hour to get up and get the, the engine running <laughs> and, uh, and to get out of bed and get dressed and, and even to shave, right? I guess you could just not shave, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, it's going to take a while. And then uh, they have problems seeing. we got a lady right now in her 80s who is pretty much, she's declared blind in one eye and in the other eye she's losing her vision. And uh, she's getting ready to walk out to her car and I was like, are you okay driving? <laughs> it just dawned on me, like, hey, you got to get from your house to the church. And she's like, it's not too bad right now. Like, I think I can still keep driving myself. And I'm thinking, maybe we ought to think about, you know, giving you a ride. <laughs> right? Because she can't see. And that's a hindrance that they have sometimes. They can't hear. You know, I learned right away whenever I first started uh, preaching there, uh, even like before I was a pastor, when I'd get an opportunity to preach, uh, the ladies would be like, right? And that was the sign. But if I wasn't getting it, they'd be like, we can't hear you. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, you know, don't shout out in the middle of the message, right? But that's what they're saying. I can't hear what's being said, right? We got a lady that, uh, anyway, I just won't go there. But yes, that was the same lady. But there's more than one. <laughs> there's more than one, okay, that have hearing problems. Okay, so uh, uh, they also have, look at this next part. Uh, sorry, I had to write this, but it's true. They have problems with their bowels and their bladders, and they will tell you about it. <laughs> they will. Well, how's it going? Well, I won't even say, <laughs> right? But you will hear all kinds of stories. And unfortunately, I, I'm getting a little older, and I've spent a lot of time with old folks, so I am just jump right into those conversations nowadays, <laughs> right? Somebody's losing blood, and I'm like, oh, really? Is it, you know, is your stool kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right, cool. you guys you guys haven't been around old people that long, all right? But that's the kind of stuff they talk about, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, anyway, so especially whenever you visit them in the hospital or nursing home, whatever. Look, there's things that uh, are hindrances to them. Sometimes they got to sit in the back of the church, right? We've roped off the back three. You've been to Iola. You see, we roped off the back three. And the idea is most churches you go to, they start filling in at the back. And they work their way forward. And I'm like, I don't want that. I want them to be closer up to the front. Actually, Brother Collins had that idea a long time ago. So he roped off the back three. It used to be four. <laughs> and, uh, and try to push them towards the front a little bit. But we've had some old folks. They're not trying to be rebellious, but they go remove that thing and just sit in the back. Because they're like, look, if I sit that close up, I won't be able to make it to the bathroom in time. <laughs> and so that is a legitimate need that they have. A legitimate hindrance that we have to keep in mind. Some of them have uh the, some of them are no longer in their right mind all right i don't say that uh belittling them but it's true some of them and i think the lady that i've made some illustrations about is there not in her right mind right you know i don't know i wasn't around uh 20 years ago around her but uh i know some signs of little things that she's done and i think i don't think that that's necessarily her does that make sense uh, and so you allowed a little bit of grace on that because she's your family. She's supposed to be like a grandma to you, right? Some are literally fighting deterioration in their brain that affects their thinking. Okay, it's a physical thing. You can you can have uh, you know arthritis and nobody you know you know gets mad at you for that. But when the mind starts deteriorating, people sometimes can't control their mind or what they say or what they do. And if we're not careful. 
we won't have any patience with that, right? Now, sometimes it still needs to be called out or corrected, but we got to understand that, okay? It affects their thinking. And some are doing all they can. Now, this is what, this is what saddens me whenever I visit an old person or sit down and talk with them at the beginning of a service or, or, or after a service. They're doing all they can to hold on to memories, right? We can bring up a lot of memories to our mind. I mean, it might take me a little bit, but I can start thinking through my kids when they were little and some stories, you know, that happened. Uh, but we can bring those back to our mind. Some of these old folks, like, they're just constantly trying to remember those. And we went and visited uh, uh, this lady. We were door knocking, actually, and I gave her the gospel. She hasn't come yet, all right? But uh, uh, she was, her name's Christy, if you think about praying for her. And she's 86, I think she's 86, and she sat there. I probably told you this story last week or something, but uh, she just kept wanting to talk about all her family. They got all the pictures, and they want to show you the pictures, and they want to just tell you all their family members and what they're doing. And after like an hour of talking, she's like, I can't believe I just sat here and talked to you, you know, about my own life. She's like, I, she's like, I feel real bad about that. Like, I don't normally do that, she said, but I just sit here alone all the time, and all I have is my memories and my thoughts. We're like, hey, we don't mind listening to you. Because, look, they, that's all they got left. And they're trying to remember that. And they might not, family might not be around as much as like they used to be. And they're just sitting there trying to bring back these memories. Okay. So here's some things we can do to help them out. We can help them reminisce on the good memories. Okay. Help them to stay positive in their thoughts and not uh, uh, start going down all the negative things. Because look, old people can also become very negative. All right? Old people, uh, one of the things that they can start doing to a young preacher or, a young, or young people in the church who start uh, being zealous for the Lord and they say, that ain't going to work. I've seen people try that before. You know, and a lot of times if you get, if you get some old folks like a, a, a deacon board in a church and they're all older, you're going to have a battle, man, because a lot of them are like, nope, we tried, that doesn't work. And they shoot everything down. And the fact of the matter is they are right. They've seen those things go bad before. And so all of a sudden, they just can't think positive about anything, and they're just like bitter, right? And, the, and they have family that, you know, used to follow the Lord, and now, they, now they're gone to the devil and all that kind of stuff. And, and it just, that, that's, those are negative things to dwell on. We want to help them to be encouraged and uh, remember the good things that happened in their day and be reminded of those good things. And I see that happen a little bit in Iola, and I love it. Like some of them, you know, all the soul winning that we're doing, a lot of those can't get out there, but you know what they start doing? They start saying, well, I remember back when we used to go soul winning. And they start sharing stories. Like I'll tell a story about something that happened on, on uh, you know, soul winning time. And then they'll say, you know, one day this happened to me. And they'll start sharing the story, right? And it's kind of fired them up a little bit. And they remember that time. And sometimes I'll preach a message and I'll, uh, I'll preach against uh, sodomites or something like that. And afterwards, you know, they'll reassure me right? The older crowd, you don't have to worry about that so much. And they'll reassure me like, hey, man, that's the way they used to preach about it, <laughs> right? You don't really have to worry about that with the older crowd so much. Well, I guess nowadays, you know, it depends on how far back you go. I'm talking about 70, 80-year-olds, 50s, 60s. Some of those guys are all messed up already. But, but you go back a little bit farther, and they're like, yeah, those, those queers, <laughs> you know? And, they, and uh, uh, But, hey, they see sometimes, they see this young generation, and I think some of them are motivated because they're like, hey, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? Amen. These guys, uh, I'm, about, I'm about to pass off the scene, but here are some young guys that are carrying the torch, right? That's what they need to see. That's what they need to be reminded and to be encouraged about that their life hasn't been a waste, you know? And so we need to help them reminisce on those and let them know that there's hope for the future. Okay, and then some have become... Weak in many ways. This is where we sometimes uh, say things about what we see in a lot of the old IFB is a lot of them have become weak and they've just given up the fight, right? You ever seen that? Like maybe they got a kid that, uh, that got real contemporary and just wanted, started to go with, you know, didn't, wasn't strong in the King James anymore. And you see the person, it's like they just give up fighting and all of a sudden they're just like okay with it. And you're like, no, man, you're the, you know, you're supposed to be, be the ones helping us younger people know that this is what, that we're not supposed to go that way. And so, uh, so sometimes they get weak and they start giving up. 
on things. But here's the thing. They can be inspired and motivated, right? You get a, an older, fo a older person and you say, man, they're old, they're not going to listen, they're set in their ways. Not necessarily. They can be inspired. They can be motivated. We've certainly seen that a lot of times. And here's the second thing. They are sinners, and they need preaching too, all right? Sometimes I feel disrespectful preaching a, a message that will be geared towards them in their age and some of their, you know, some of the, the bad things that they might be doing, you know, like being bitter or whatever. And I feel like, why am I picking on the old people? Well, here's why, because most of the church is old people and they need preaching. <laughs> they, they, and they're sinners just like we're all sinners. And so they need preaching. So some, here's, here's another bad thing, though, to remember. There are some who think too highly of themselves and demand that their way is the right way. Okay, that's certainly a problem when, and sometimes when dealing with older folks. Praise the Lord, I don't have to deal with that. I don't, th I don't think I, I think I have a lot of liberty at Iola, uh, in Iola to be the pastor. Praise the Lord for that. Not every preacher has that liberty. Uh, but some are like, no, nope, my way is the right way, and I don't care what you have to say. And, uh, and, and, and that's just because they think too highly of themselves, right? So here's what we can do. We can, number one, take the wise, uh, take, uh, let me see here, take the wise and humble advice, all right? I think of Jethro giving his son-in-law, Moses, uh, advice, and it was very humble, right? And he said, pray to God, if God will allow you to do this, I think this would be a good thing to do. That's the way I interpret that. And, uh, and he gave him good advice. We need to take that advice when it's given to us in the right way. And uh, we need to consider all advice, like even if it's a bad advice or the person that's coming to give you the advice, you're like, oh, this person's always talking about this. Or, just take it. Just listen to them. Hear them out. And, uh, and at the end of the day, this is, I'm particularly talking here from the perspective of a pastor. We need to be respectful, but then also we need to remember, and this isn't a power trip, okay, but we need to remember who makes the final decision. Right? Right. We can't just let because they're older and this is the way they've always done it, just ne necessarily just always get their way and be too scared to face them or whatever. And uh, like I said, praise the Lord, I haven't even had to deal with that a whole lot. Some I've had to s slowly, because I understand that they have a lot of experience, so I've had to slowly like assure them that I'm not just trying to come in here and flip everything upside down, but I do believe differently in some ways that they do. And, uh, and look, they've respected me for that, because I listen to them, and I, uh, I, I'm honest with them, and I make the final decision whether they like it or not, but thankfully everyone's been very supportive. And, uh, and that's uh, just a little bit about dealing with the older folks and ministering to the elderly. I hope that helped. Uh, I'm kind of I'm happy, although it's, I think it's a good, been a good series, but I'm kind of happy to not, not <laughs> have to preach on it anymore. I almost feel like I'm, uh, I'm disrespecting them by talking about you know, some of their, their mannerisms and stuff like that. But look, it's, it's a reality of dealing with uh, older folks. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, all that you've done for us. Thank you for the church. Uh, thank you for our, our uh, spiritual fathers of the faith that have gone before us. And we thank you also for a new generation of, of people who have a zeal for you and want to carry on the torch. I pray you help us make wise decisions based on your word and following your lead. And also, Lord, that we would be uh, humble enough and uh, wise enough to, to listen to the counsel of, of our elders. I uh, pray you bless now in Jesus' name. Amen.